chaos. <laughs> like, no, but real talk, right? <laughs> so, like, I don't know, like, I have some friends, like, a couple of my friends recently have gone to CSM, um, and I'm really, really proud of them. They're black, they're from my council estate. It was a huge journey for them to get here, and, you know, they're coming here as, like, a mature student. I don't think 22 is mature, but, like, you know, <laughs> they, we're still kids. Um, but, like, and then they come here, and they're super excited, and then they get this shock when, like, the industry doesn't want them. And when the industry won't listen to them, or when the industry will tell them, actually, like, you can't design like this because this was in last week, or this was in last year, but they commodified that trend. Like, sorry, Gold Hoops was when we were interested in you last year. And it's like, I think the industry, in order to start doing stuff for us and bodies like ours, just has to put us at the, not even on the table, but at the head of the table. Like, because if we're not running it, then all that's going to happen is bad representation of it. Like, where are our black trans trans people on the table deciding what to wear, decide what looks good for us, rather than just being booked for, like, one photo shoot or, like, one little ID magazine thing, you know? Like, yeah, so put us at the head of the table and then see how that table turns fly as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a valid point. I think um, as a current graduate of um, CSM, going through the whole system um, it's an amazing um, experience um, within itself but I think for me um, I felt as if I didn't identify with a certain group um, and the way in which I designed as an artist and the designer wasn't conformed in what they wanted and so you know you're marginalised into a section um, which is so hard to deal with once you get into industry and I think unless you're you know strong enough to actually break the, break the boundaries and actually disregard what the industry say it can be actually off-putting, um, daunting, and so as Travis was saying, I think they need, as he said, which is so important, the actual strong people within it, and is, is the actual people us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they have enough of us within the industry. Um, I've been working within the industry now for about six years, but it's taken such a long time to get into it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the people that are at the head of the table are not our representation, um, and I think so that would be the preliminary beginning of things, is obviously getting the people that have gone through it, understood it, um, and even give you the actual you know, primary source of what they're going through. Mm. I think it just, the fashion industry represents a larger structural problem of <coughs> oppression, and until that's resolved, really, then it's not gonna be reflected in that industry. I mean, I'm thinking about who makes the cloth, who makes the, the textiles that then get used in the industry. You know, there's, there's real, Disparage, uh, what's the word? Like, yeah, disparages of like, yeah, who gets to, who gets to, do, yeah, have that's, um, uh, what's the word? Sorry. Access? Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, there's, there, yeah, there's, there's just, it's polarized and it, that really needs to change. Um, so I don't see that happening until that really happens but I think that yeah the more I mean the, the thing about fashion is that it really does look to the streets it really and you know who is on the streets it is people like us you know so it's it's like they want they want that on one hand they want to commodify another but yeah structurally I think there needs to be changes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, just quickly because I'm not in the fashion industry um, uh, and I don't really Care what those people that we're talking about think, except precisely for the reason that Raju mentioned. Like they are specifically looking towards us. So um, I think one way, and I also agree that other systems and structures of oppression would have to shift and change radically um, for this to even be possible. But one step that really shouldn't be that grand, but of course we know it is, is that the people who are already in charge, like unless there was some sort of like mass wokeness, like mass consciousness and all these like white fashion moguls would just like lay down their cloth that they again didn't make or craft or produce and just like like walk everyone collectively like walk backwards out of the room. Um, <laughs> They could just be aware of the, the sentence that I like to tell white people who think that allies are a thing all the time, which is that it's not about you. Um, like that necessary, like sometimes I feel like the idea about being fashion forward um, in the larger industry is like not just looking to the streets, but like seeing the most like minoritized or like unique or like from the small place and um, that speaks least to your experience and then like uplifting that. And I think even if a similar thing wound up happening, to make that a less violent process would be specifically to go, well, like, this is also not for me. And so 
to do something is like what Raji was talking about, or like forgive me if I'm like misrepresenting it, but like um, at least being more conscious or aware that the cloth. I mean, that's alone like the production of those materials into the fashion industry, but like the thing that is the quote unquote final result um, contains a narrative in it. So if you just learn about what that narrative is or could be, then the fact that you or like a white fashion mogul designer was still like getting saris and putting them on a runway, maybe not putting them on white models, maybe not putting them on cis models, you know, like thinking about, well, the narrative comes from these kind of people. Oh, wait, these people exist. So why don't I just get them to like put on their own clothes and like walk a bit, you know, like I think that um, granted they'd still be in power, but it would seed some of the way for their overarching narratives and not have such a heavy hand on the process or the experience. I mean, then it also links to colonialism because Always. it's, do you know what I mean? That's, that's what colonialism is about, is taking things and, ma- and making them yours. Yeah. And I think that's, th- there's still that mentality of that's how it works and that needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add quickly, like, because um, I'm all about like imagining other worlds and this, like what you mentioned about like our systems of oppression would have to go first. Um, like, what would it look like if, like, instead of us looking to New York Fashion Week at the moment for our clothes, instead, like, black and other POC folk cultivated in our communities to decide that their green next to their shop was going to be their runway? Or what would it look like to say that our basketball court yeah. was going to be where we were going to show our athletic trends? Like, all these ideas of how we can actually just say, we don't need you. Like, yeah. we don't need New York Fashion Week. We don't need all these, like, ideas. Let's find, like, our next-door neighbour, our auntie, the people cooking dinner for us on Sunday and decide, hey, after dinner and after church, Let's go, because church was fashion for me, right? Mm. Like, that was my early example of, like, powerful black femininity. Like, those those outfits were dope, and then my outfit turned dope because of that. Like, so let's, like, that's our runway. Like, we don't need New York Fashion Week. That's so real. Those hats really changed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's like a South Asian wedding. (laughs)